It's time, I want to say, what is up, Calvary? How are we doing tonight? Hey, man, I got to tell you guys, um, yeah, hey, girl. Uh, I got to tell you guys before I get going, I, I do, I get, just by God's privilege, I get to do this uh, quite a bit and speak to students and uh, folks, and I, got, I, I need to tell you guys thank you. I need to tell you guys thank you because this week has been so life-giving and refreshing for me, not as a pastor, but as a fellow believer, as we've gone through this scripture together. Like, it's just given me a, a cool little reset in my spirit and in my, uh, and in my relationship with Jesus. And then every evening to come in here and have that reaffirmed by watching you guys enter into worship and worship so authentically and watch you guys pray for each other after chapels. It has just been such an awesome week for me to watch the hope of Jesus play out in the life of so many of you guys. And so for me as a big brother in Christ, I just want to tell you, thank you so much for serving and loving Jesus faithfully. Would you guys give yourself, give you a round of applause. And then I, I do, I want to thank, man, all the awesome adults that came to camp this week, that gave up a week of work or vacation to kick it with you guys. And, and you adults, sincerely, man, you guys can cheer louder for your adult leaders and that, your cabin leaders. Come on, man. You are the most group of encouraging adult leaders I've, I've come across in a long time. So many of you found me like when I'm sitting in the coffee shop or in the back of the room and just such kind, encouraging words. And I just watch you guys doing it with each other and with students. And that is so, so, so phenomenal to watch you pour into each other. And, and then the last group I want to thank, man, is, is the staff uh, here at uh, HSM. Man, you guys have the best staff that I've been around in a long time. Long time, man. Those guys and those gals are world-class leaders, sincerely. And, and I have to say this. You do have one of the coolest youth pastors I've ever met, man. Would you guys give it up for your pastor, Brian? Dude, world-class leader, man. World-class leader. It's been so good kicking it with you this week, man. So, yeah. There we go. You almost made it a whole week without that, Brian. There you go. Man, you are welcome for that. Uh, we're going to jump into it. I'm going to tr try to be quick. That's what preacher, preachers say before they go for a long time. But I want to ask you this question. Uh, like, what do you want to be? It's a rhetorical question. Don't answer out loud. Some of you ADDs. Like, uh, what do you want to be known for when it's all said and done? When it's all said and done, what do you want to be known for? What do you want people to say about you? What do you want people to remember about the person, the, the young man, the young woman that you are? What do you want to be known for? You see, for all of us, it's different things. And we want to leave our mark on this world. We want to leave our mark in our schools, in our teams, on our homes, in our communities. We want to leave those marks so people remember who we were. No one wants to just fade into dust and wind. It, we want people to remember us. One of my favorite illustrations of this is, is this guy right here, Roger Buckley. I think we got this. Look at what this guy says. Roger, who hated this park and everyone in it. That's what this guy wanted to be remembered as. He's like, listen, when I die, make sure you put a plaque on that bench that I sit in the park every day and remind people, they suck, and I want them to know that. Oh, everybody just has a different kind of point of view or a different perspective that they want to be remembered by. But I'll tell you, it's early in your life that you have to decide what you're going to be remembered for. It's weeks like this in Marietta where you have to decide, put a stake in the ground, draw a line in the sand and say, this is what I will be known for. I heard a story of a young man. He was traveling with his college class from Wheaton College to England. And this group 
of Bible students, they're going to travel to England and they were going to go learn about the early fathers of the church, John Wesley and men like that, Jonathan Edwards, early revival preachers. So the professor takes this small group of students and he kind of has them kind of just cruising around, watch, watching different things, going to different museums. And one day, they go to the home of John Wesley. If you know who this guy is, he was one of the early revivalist preachers in the English church. Riding from town to town, village to village, bringing the good news of Jesus Christ. So they go and visit his house. And as they're getting a tour around the house, the tour guide says, this room right here is his room. It's his bedroom. And if you look in the corner right there, you'll see two worn out patches in the ground. And, and they said that's where he knelt multiple times a day. Praying that God would bring revival to that continent, to that nation. Everyone ahs and oohs and proceeds with the rest of the tour and then makes their way back into the vehicle. And they get in the car ready to leave and the professor does the head count like teachers do the head count when we're on field trips. And lo and behold, there's a boy missing because it's always a boy who's missing. And the teacher, professor, heads back into the home, and he hears muttering. He hears a quiet voice. And he darkens the doorway of the bedroom. And there in the corner, knelt, knelt down in the same spot as John Wesley is, a young man. Praying, God, would you bring revival like that to America? God, would you bring revival like that back to my nation? The professor goes over and puts a gentle hand on the shoulder of the young man. And he says, Billy, it's time to go. See, that was a 19-year-old Billy Graham who knelt down on foreign soil and prayed that God would bring revival to America. And for about the next 70 years, God would use Billy Graham specifically to fill stadiums of tens of thousands of people as he would proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and he would bring revival to this nation. Because he wanted to be known for something greater than himself. He wanted to be a difference maker in the time that God had given him on this earth. So what do you want to be known for? Are you going to be a difference maker? Are you going to be a man or woman of God? That says the words of 1 Kings 18, 37. Says the prayer of Elijah. Where Elijah said... Answer me, O Lord, so that these people will know you, will know that you are Lord, Lord our God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Answer me, Lord, answer me so that these people will know that you are Lord, our God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Will you be the difference maker that this becomes your prayer, that this becomes your motto, that this becomes your creed, that this becomes your heart's desire?
that the people in your schools, the people in your community, the people far and wide would turn their hearts back to God. And that God would use you to do that. But my friends, understand this. Being a difference maker isn't easy. Being a difference maker isn't comfortable. Walking with Jesus isn't all rose petals and lollipops. And even for the strongest of us, even for the most convicted of us, there will be seasons where we are weary and tired and only want to retreat. Brian shared this with the leaders right before we started service as we prayed for you guys. Is that James even said that Elijah was a man just like us. Elijah was human, but he prayed, Scripture says, but he prayed fervently and earnestly. And God used him to make a difference. But even Elijah faced moments where it wasn't enough, where he felt like he didn't have enough in the tank and simply wanted to retreat. After 50 plus years of God's people following worthless gods, of treating God's word trivially, Ahab takes the throne, he marries Jezebel, they, they erect altars to praise Baal. Elijah speaks through, God speaks through Elijah, and Elijah says it's not going to rain for three and a half years, and God fulfills the promise, God fulfills the judgment, and it doesn't rain for three and a half years, and Elijah is provided for in the wilderness by ravens, and then a brook, and then a widow, and then God tells Elijah to face his enemy. And Elijah goes and faces Ahab and tells Ahab and the 450 prophets of Baal, the 400 prophets of Ash Asherah, to meet him on Mount Carmel. And there God tears down the altars of the false gods. And God consumes the sacrifice of Elijah. God consumes the sacrifice and the gift that God's people brought in the 12 jars of water. But then Ahab, as the rain finally begins to fall, this heavy rain begins to fall on the land, Ahab gets in his chariot and he rides to tell Jezebel. Remember, Jezebel... This foreigner, this heathen, this pagan who wanted to stomp out the people of God and the way of God was a ruthless tyrant. And Ahab runs to tell her what Elijah has done. And in verse 11... We find Elijah, who is fearful for his life. Verse 3 says that Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Because look at what Jezebel had said to him. She said, may the gods, little g gods, deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of the, like one of them. Like the prophets that Elijah just had killed. Jezebel's like, may God, her false gods, deal with her if she doesn't kill Elijah in the next day. So Elijah runs, and he runs, and he runs, and he runs. In verse 5 and 6 and 7, 
Elijah's so weary, so tired of running, falls asleep, and God wakes him up and feeds him and tells him, prepare for the journey that is ahead. And scripture tells us, Elijah gets up, and when God has strengthened him, he travels for 40 days and 40 nights until he reaches Mount Harab. Mount Harab, we might know that as the mountain of God or Mount Sinai where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Forty days, Elijah goes into the wilderness until he reaches the place that God met the Israelites after he freed them from slavery in Egypt for 400 years. Where God spoke down to his people and he said, you will be my people. And here is the covenant between us. And here is Elijah, the difference maker, hiding, hiding under the shadow of God. Look at what verse 11 says. Let's read this together. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, and have put your, prophet to put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left and now they are trying to kill me too. You see my friends, many of you are going to go back home and life is going to get back to normal and there are going to be instances where you're going to remember these days you're going to remember these last five days. And you're going to feel like Elijah. Though you have a calling on you. Though you have a destiny within you. You're going to feel like Elijah. And you're going to have these talks with God on your walk to school. As you park your car in front of your high school. As you walk into the locker room. You're going to have these conversations with God. Where you tell God. I'm the only one left. The Lord said to him, go back. You're going to be sitting, give me your eyes, I want you to get this. You're going to be sitting back in your normal and you're going to say to yourself, I wish I was back at camp. I wish I was back at camp where it was all gravy, where, where people are leading us in worship, there's good food, we're being encouraged, someone's helping me to read my Bible every day. I just wish I could get back there because that's just where I feel safe, God, just kind of uh, just under your wing, God, and, and that's where I just, just want to be there. God's going to tell you, go back. Go back into that classroom. Go back into that job. Go back into that locker room. Go back into that community. Be a difference maker for me. Not here in the chapel. Not here in the sanctuary. But out there. But out there. Where the battle is. Where the war rages. Where darkness needs light. Go back. 
Take what you have learned here this week. Take what you have mastered here this week. And say, God, I'm going to make a difference for you. God, I'm going to be a difference maker. I'm going to be a change agent. I am going to be known as one who is consumed by the fire of God and shines brightly for the Lord Jesus. And though Elijah felt like he was alone, God goes on to remind Elijah that he isn't alone. He tells Elijah to go back to the desert of Damascus, and there he's going to put a king over Aram. He tells him to anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. He tells him to anoint Elisha, who's going to be the next great prophet of Israel. God even tells him there is a remnant of 7,000 people in Israel who have never bent a knee before Baal and who have never kissed him with their mouth. He's telling Elijah, you're not alone. And young man, young woman, let me tell you this. When you go back, remember, you're not alone. This is the good news. God has prepared a remnant in Thousand Oaks. For those moments of weakness, those moments when those stumbling blocks come back in your head and in your consciousness and you're like, I just can't do this or I'm going to fail again or I've messed up again. God's going to send you with others. And he says, remember my power and remember the power of with. There is nothing more powerful outside of the power of God and the power of God's people together. I saw this video that I think so beautifully encapsulates what it looks like when we lean on one another in a time of weakness and distress. Here, check this out. Oh, and he's starting to slow. And there is a little way to go. There's half a K to go. He's losing his sense of direction. This is worrying. Jonathan Brownlee has lost it now and has staggered to a stop at the side of the course. And Alistair's stopped to help him along. And Alistair is going to try and carry his brother home as the Olympic champion carries his younger brother towards the podium. Matt, is this allowed? Is he allowed to help his brother? You know, is that part of the rules? I'm not too sure. We've never seen anything like this before. To finish in second and third, but Johnny can hardly stand. And Alistair is having to drag him across the line and pushing him home, pushing him home for second. Johnny finishes in second. Goodness me, what an incredible conclusion here. That's what we do for one another. When your legs are wobbly, when your faith is uncertain, remember the power of with and look over to the left, look over to the right and see that girl that you're in small group with right now. See that guy who's in your cabin making wrong decisions, making backwards decisions in a couple months and don't judge them from afar but come up close, put your arm underneath their arm and said, for this next season, I'm going to carry you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to hold you up. Because I love you. 
And I know that God has a call on his life for you. And you might be stumbling right now, but I'm going to hold you up and actually I'm going to push you over the finish line. Because that's what Jesus has done for each and every one of us. He's held us up when we're weak. And he pushes us into a position that we don't even deserve. The Apostle John writes the words of Jesus, captures the words of Jesus in John 17, where Jesus says this, I have given them the glory that you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Hours before Jesus goes to the cross, Jesus spends that little bit of energy, that little bit of time to pray to God on our behalf that we would be one, that we would be brought to completeness in Christ Jesus. And then Jesus says when we're brought to completeness, when we're in unity, when we understand the power of with, then the world will know. Then the world will know who Jesus is. The world's not going to know who Jesus is by your good deeds, by how much you tithe. The world's not going to know who Jesus is by how much you read your Bible. The world's not going to know who Jesus is even by how much we stand on platforms and preach. The world's going to know who Jesus is by the way Christians band together. By the way, young men and young women who have everything else calling out to them in culture, calling out to the, them in the world, say no to those things and say yes to Jesus in a collective voice. And in one accord say, Jesus, may you bind us together. So many of us came here this week with chains around our hearts, with chains around us, slaves to sin, slaves to darkness, to anxiety, depression, anger, lust, jealousy. This week, by the mighty work of Jesus Christ, God took what once bound us to bind us together. God took our brokenness and said, this will be the testimony of your breakthrough. God took what the world intended for bad and now has turned it into good. And now when you go back to your places and spaces, you're going to go with the chains. But you're going to go as a sign of victory and say, look at the chains that God has broken in me. And look how God has bound me together with a community of faith that says, by the Spirit of God, you will use us to turn their hearts back again. That Jesus would use HSM at Calvary Westlake to turn their hearts back again. Look at me in the eye, young man, young woman, and I'm done. There is no plan B. Do you remember me saying that on Sunday night? There is no plan B. 
you are God's plan and not you individually, you collectively. The power of with. That is what Elijah walked off that mountain with. Understanding that there was a remnant, that there was an Elisha. That there was one who would give everything up to follow him. But to follow not just Elijah, but to follow God in him. To follow Christ in him. Let these chains be your testimony. Let yourselves be bound together for the sake. Of Jesus Christ. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to stand to your feet. And I want to start, I want to end where we started. when you showed up here on, on Sunday, maybe you felt alone. Maybe you just felt like a face in the crowd. Maybe you felt so far from God. Maybe some of you in here are good kids. You've been walking with God faithfully. You've been a difference maker in your school, in your church, and you've been loving the Lord, and you needed this week as an extra encouragement that you're walking along the right path. But here's what I know after watching you guys, watching you guys at the lunch table, at the dinner table, watching you funk up the coffee shop after wreck, that you're better together, that no one, I'd be shocked if anyone here is leaving with less friends than they showed up with. That's what this is about, the body of Christ. Not the head, not the toe, not the finger, but the body of Christ, and that's you. Together. Yeah, you know where I'm going. I want you to put a gentle hand on the person next to you. Don't get weird. This is not your moment, young man. This is not your moment. Save that for the bus ride. All the way across the aisles. Across the aisle. Get across the aisle. Come on. Come on, all the way across. Come on. If you're a leader in the back, don't stand in the back. Get, get in with these kids. My friends my friends and my new family in Thousand Oaks. Hey, Pastor Brian, I'm just throwing it out right now. Listen, I like you guys. You need a speaker for next year, put me down. I'm back. I'll come back if you want me, baby. I love this crew, and I want to come back next year. You know why I want to come back, Brian, next year? I want to come back next year and see this room filled with double the amount of students because you went back and said, I'm going to be a difference maker for the sake of Christ. And you're going to go home and you're going to invest in someone this year and you're going to get them back to church with you every Sunday. You're going to get them to small groups on Tuesdays and Thursdays and you're going to bring them to camp here next year and you're going to set your community on fire for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. So before we rip this roof off in a song of praise, let me pray this benediction, this prayer that we started this week that I think is even more poignant and more applicable now. The words of Paul to the church in Ephesus. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love 
may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of God. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all the generations forever and ever and all God's people said
This is how I find my fellows. This is how I find my fellows. I made a decision to worship. I have made my decision I'm going to worship This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, to crown Him in glory forever, starting right now. Be bound together in worship. Be bound together in praise. We're going to get to the point in this song. We don't do fast songs at our church a lot, but we're going to make this a fast song later. David danced, David danced out of his clothes. I want you to keep your clothes on. But he was so undignified. He did not care what anybody thought because this God is so worthy of praise. And you have an opportunity tonight to give your God praise like never before, a praise that only you can give him. And he's so worthy. So make a decision tonight to look anxiety in its face and worship your God. Make a decision to look depression in its face and worship your God. Make a decision to look fear in its face and worship your God. Make your decision. He's worth it. He is worthy of it. And He is here. So this is how I find my battle. This is how I find my battle. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. 
to your promises. We cling to your presence. May you go with us tonight. May you go with us as we go. May we know your truth. May we know your presence in every season, in every moment, against everything. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Alright, stay right where you are. Stay right where you are. Right now, we are going to head off to the next part of camp. And the next part of camp is mandatory for all of us. All of us are going to walk right now out these chapel doors, and we are going to go straight to the beach. We're going to go straight out these doors. We're going to walk across the parking lot, walk across the campus, and we're going to be going to the beach. When we get there, we'll explain what's happening, but I need you to hear that we're all going there. No one's going to the room. No one's going to the coffee shop. No one's hanging back here. All of us are going out those doors and straight to the beach, and we'll let you know what happens next. Tonight, we're going to continue our worship through something else, but that's not going to take place here. It's going to take place on the beach. So would you walk quickly over there? 